All right, so now you have a Evolving in Pieces donkeys immediately starting to run towards the end of the hallway. It's it's very interesting uh -huh. to see how many packs uh, groups grab and bring back into this first lantern. Uh, Dratnus, are you liking what you're seeing with the comps here? Yeah, this is sweet. We've got some we got some nice ones in here. So we do have an elemental shaman represented. It's from Evolving, and yeah, this dungeon one of my favorite ones to to see that elemental shaman in. Uh, meanwhile, Pieces Donkeys playing the Resto Shaman instead, and they have the double mage, but they have moved their arcane mage over to Venthyr Moonkin instead. What is Venthyr Moonkin like in this dungeon, Tettles? Uh, normally it, it depends, but it can be very annoying because then your group is like, oh, Tettles, please open up the lantern. And you're like, I would rather press my cooldowns right now, but they're like, you have to open the lantern. We can't do it without you. And you just have to open the lantern. <laughs> if, you, if you press your Ravenous Frenzy, and oh. you're trying no, to the snipe. Oh. Rage on, oh, no. Rage on. <laughs> yeah, that's the insta on. Oh no. Uh, so nothing. Oh, please don't oh, die again. Oh, oh. Please don't die again. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, okay, here's my question for you though. If you have your Ravenous Frenzy going, and you, can you click a lantern? No, right? If you do, you get stunned, right? I think you can. No, no, okay. uh, you can. Really? Okay. Can. It doesn't have to be Druid abilities that you're casting. You, you have to just be doing something. Okay, so if you're in the middle of a channel, it won't stun you? I see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's you nice. can even be like, wow, 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 evolving. They are doing this whole first pull onto boss with all those stacks of Venthyr Lantern and Incinerate I love that. as well. This is so scary. Huge. Look at Shella ascending here at 140,000 DPS, but their Elemental Shaman and Mage and Paladin are all also there at 70,000 DPS, including their healer, their Paladin. What on earth is happening here on my damage meter? Rumor has it that Shelly operates best with just the light of his monitors gracing and cresting his face. He, his powers are just unfolding right before us. <laughs> he lights up the room enough just... just by himself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Look at, look at that. He's doing at least 20% more damage than the remainder of his group, just showing them why he is the team captain. Yeah, I mean, that was that was an absurd amount of DPS. As they finish this boss, their fourth best damage dealing was from a, a healer at 32,000 DPS. I mean, that is just a crazy, crazy number from Evolving, and they have gained so much time as a result of executing that. But look at Pieces Donkeys. They are not far behind either. They have Crixus at a third of its health, and they have a little bit of extra count, uh, but they do have that one death on the board. Not a big deal, though. It only costs them those five seconds. And the Ankh, and their, their Moonkin has gone down as well here. They do have a Battle Res available, but their Moonkin was their Battle Res caster. Now they're trying to soak this charge, but with a player down, that's going to deal increasing damage, and things are starting mm -hmm. to go a little bit sideways here for Pieces Donkeys. Yeah, now evolving, uh, continuing on, making their way through the dungeon. They do have this Chamber Sentinel with this Overseer, which is not mobs that you commonly see pull together. However, with the way that evolving was grouping up a bunch of these mobs, it makes it so a pull like this is really not that bad. Uh, they were pulling the Chamber Sentinel and all of those mobs back into this room and were able to get everything grouped up relatively quickly. Now you see Alex here looking to grab those sprites, which are those imp-style mobs. And I wonder where they're going to take them to. I wonder if they're going to activate the lantern or I wonder if they're going to just use the Acolytes to uh, buff up their Lantern. It's going to be interesting to see where they're going to look to use that. But they are gathering up right around this Lantern here. And yeah, look at that. Their Mage is activating that Lantern as he is playing that Frost. And Vinthyr, pretty good for Frost. They're getting all of those Sprites in. And once they do end up killing those off, they will gain 10 stacks of that Lantern buff pretty quickly, which is a 50% damage gain. Yeah, it's actually interesting here. We do have two different covenants between the two Frost Mages. Venthyr, that kind of traditional Frost, single target raid covenant on the side of Evolving. Whereas Pieces are sticking with that Night Fae, which is uh, also very I don't get good, it. especially in an AoE circumstance. Um, I think it might just be a case of like, okay, we, we want our Mage to be opening the Lanterns, right? Because we don't want our Paladin, who's who needs to potentially be healing. Uh, to be obligated to do so. Whereas on the side of Pieces Donkeys, you've got the Moonkin, who's also been here. And so you can just have them open it while they're out of their cooldowns. And literally, you would never miss a Moonkin out of their cooldowns. Like, if they're casting, True. if they're not casting, there's literally no way to tell. You won't see them on the damage meter. Uh, so it may as well have them open the lanterns. Interestingly enough, it looks like Pieces Donkeys Moonkin is running mm. that, that staff from uh, Tectus, I think, with the weird tentacles on it. Uh, the only like, time I've ever noticed a... I've ever seen Transmog in my life. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what were you gonna say? I, I thought you actually had like a, a cool staff that I was like, what master staffs are there that do anything? <laughs> no, no, not a cool not a cool reference at all. <laughs> a random yeah. transmog. Yeah. Look at evolving, they pulled execution for Ruth with this jab yeah. over. So this is going to be so, their second uh, Tormented mob, uh, and it is really nice to, to have those two dead already and a time advantage, because look at Pieces, right? Pieces is going with the faster and more yeah. aggressive strategy of skipping the first Tormented mob, but even with the faster strategy, they are behind here, uh, because Evolving you know, may have had a, a, in theory, slower Tormented strategy, but they actually found a way to be doing something efficient with both Tormented mobs, right? So even though they killed both of them, both of them were killed with a lot of useful stuff. In particular, the way they just brought that incinerator into the massive pull with the first boss is inspired and it's just a, a fantastic move. Bless you. Oh, uh, that was Jack Sneezy. Jack is muted. I don't know why I just instinctively said bless you to somebody who's muted. Um, <laughs> Uh, so now the spiteful, the spiteful are spawning for evolving, and uh, um, they're refreshing their lantern buff over and over again. And it looks like this elemental shaman is really paying dividends on the side of evolving. I, I love this comp. It's not a comp that you would have expected to see coming into the weekend in a dungeon like this, but the more we see this Aflock in, in Sanguine Depths, the more I really do like how they have been utilizing it. Yeah, I mean, the the fact that both Af and Destro are good in a tournament, when you when that is the case and when Shella is on your team, that is just a really, really good feeling because I don't think there's anybody you would rather have on your MDI team given, like, both of those specs are good. You're not going to have to have anybody learn them. Shella is already so, so strong at both of those specs. Now all we need to happen is to have a Demonology dungeon because I think Shella, as good as he is at Aft and, and Destro, Demonology is, is the one that I've seen be his true passion. Is that Curse of Weakness that he has applied? And is that Curse of Tongues that he's yeah, applying you know, to just, mobs? Just helping out, <laughs> casting a couple he's of one curses. Of the Dude, he's helping out the boys. He's so, got he's got to put some curses up. My suspicion is he needs to use a couple globals to not rip threat, right? Look at the damage meter right now. Maybe he knows he can't do too much damage for the first like 5 or 6 seconds. So he's just like, "All right. I'll cast some curses. I'll ca I'll help out. Don't worry. I got you." Yeah, don't mind if I do, big dog. Yeah, and <laughs> soon all we got to see all we got to see is some venthyr warlock action because you know venthyr warlock covenant ability actually just applies a relevant curse to each mob it hits as well just aoe curse wow so cool is there is there a curse that's a damage gain unfortunately no there, it just oh. it applies it applies tongues to the casters and uh it applies weakness to the to auto attackers along with damage but it also does that I see. Yeah. All right. So Tarvald has been engaged by evolving. They are grabbing some of these ghouls with these uh, with Tarvald. The ghouls are probably the most dangerous and uh, not great mobs in in most of Shadowlands dungeons. The count that they give relative to the damage that they deal to your tank is astonishingly scary. However, whenever you have a ten stack of the lantern like that from the side of evolving, those ghouls are no match for our our elemental shaman hero as he pops all of his damage off on them gets his nice chain lightning uh, hitting four targets overloading on top of those mobs and they are just blowing up Tarvald right here spamming those lightning bolts now wow so so Light awesome lightning yeah. <laughs> lightning bolts shella great uh, great use there the drain soul keeping himself alive through the heavy damage that boss chooses to deal to whoever it's castigating. And there we go with the Paladin finishing in a, a cool second place on the meters on that boss pull. Ah, uh, yes. All right, so now is the third boss of the instance, Grand Proctor Borrelia. I suspect that they're going to pull this with all of the trash in the room. Look at that, they're eyeballing it. They're walking back and they're looking oh, back yeah. and forth. Um, they, they've engaged it all with the trash. They need to make sure that they get some of the kicks on well, these oppressors. The the Rack Soul cast, what were we going to say, Jonas? This is one of the, look at that, there's that Sigil of Silence. This is one of those yeah. spots where Vengeance Demon Hunter just brings so, so much utility with the, the Sigil of Silence Ooh. and the Sigil of Chains. That keeps these mobs under such a, a heavy amount of control. They're all nicely stacked up. You get all the Spite Pulls in the same spot. There was a Sigil of Misery, even, to help uh, stop the Spite Pulls from reaching their targets. Uh, and of course, with a fully ranged comp, one of the big advantages is that when Spite Full spawns, you're like, eh. Whatever, you know, I'm, I'm 40 yards away. What's it going to do to me? Um, so both teams actually taking advantage of that by playing three range DPS each. 
All right. Now, dude, Beryllia has gotten absolutely chunked. It's like Zyro yeah. was talking about earlier on in the weekend. Warlock, especially, especially Affliction, is so good if you're able to just get a bunch of trash mobs grouped on top of bosses and then just cleave your AoE from your uh, Sow of the Seeds, from your Seed of Corruption onto the boss while doing effectively a, a boatload of damage to all of the mobs that are surrounding it. And you see Shelly there still over 20k DPS well into a minute into the fight. Yeah, huge, huge damage being dealt here. And a lot of that is dealt to the primary target as well. Warlock Affliction in particular does get quite a bit of priority damage. You know, you get all these soul shards from the other things you're hitting and whether you, you decide to funnel that into uh, seeds or into Malefic Rapture, you do still deal a lot of that damage to the primary target. Not as much as the Elemental Shaman though. The Elemental Shaman and the Frostmage actually both also heavy funnel damage classes. So this comp is really good at single target while there's a lot of AoE around, right? You have the Shaman using that Earthquake Earthshock, I believe, legendary. Yeah, I'm uh -huh. not 100% sure on that. Let me check. Yeah, exactly. The Earthquake Earthshock legendary. So uh, again, a heavy incentive towards AoE while also dealing a lot of damage to one specific target in the AoE. Yeah. Uh, now you see Evolving there grabbing all of that trash with General Call. You did see Alex immediately dropping his shield to give himself some uh, breathing room. You're able to use the shield, like if you use it almost like first global that you engage mm -hmm. General Call, you get effectively a free use of it before he ends up casting his AOE that you, you would otherwise have to shield. And so it, it, it is just a free use and you would rather use it for mitigation um, on the tank. Alex is dropping pretty low, but he's able to use his trinket to get a fairly sizable shield. And now uh, General Call has been re-engaged again. They will probably open the lantern here in a moment, pull a bunch of cadets, uh, get some spike pulls and get a 10 stack. But that's not gonna be until later because we've seen a lot of groups pull a, a substantial trash pack onto the boss with Ash and Hollow, with Bloodlust at the very end of the General Call wing. And so they need to save that lantern and that 50% damage increase for that. Yeah, here we go. That final little bit of the gauntlet is starting now. You can see they're already moving over towards that lantern. It'll have to be their Frost Mage or their Holy Paladin who does open the lantern. You can see Sigil of Misery here used to keep those Acolytes under control until they're ready. Their tank, Alex, just jumping ahead, grabbing all of the mobs and then running back there. And they're gonna use Sigil of Silence to help group up all these casters. Beautiful combination and overlap of all their abilities, opening the lantern and there we go. Uh, everything coming together. It looks like not even needing the Ashen Hallow here. That red effect you see on the ground, that's just the lantern being open because I think that means Ashen Hallow will be available during the boss fight itself just to help nuke it that little bit, well, actually that, that large bit faster as Ashen Hallow does a, <laughs> a lot tremendous of amount of damage, yeah. I'm, I'm interested to see how much damage the uh, Elemental Shaman and the Affliction Warlock are going to be doing on that pull too. Uh, yesterday, we did see... Um, from team name, I, I, I keep forgetting their name. From team name, we saw them bust out that Affliction Warlock, and it looked really solid. Mikkel, not an Affliction main, is what I would say about that. He, it's not that he played it poorly, he's just not an AF main, whereas Shelly is is the Warlock player's Warlock, favorite Warlock player kind of situation, <laughs> where all Warlocks watch him for uh, advice. All right, so it looks like they're just going to be pulling these mobs. Let's see what... <laughs> how how much they're doing here. It looks like they've imprisoned something. And you know when the boss dies in less than a minute, imprison effectively just deletes a mob from the from the dungeon, right? You don't get count from it, but it's just gone until the end of the dungeon as long as they can kill Call before that imprison is up. And here comes everything. Ash and Hallow, Bloodlust, every single cooldown known to man is here with 70,000 DPS crested by both the Affliction Warlock and the Elemental Ooh. Shaman. Oh, and they're, they're having a fun. Oh no! A mage. Ooh. Okay, they do have a battle res. They still have another one left over after this as well. General He Call. lost his 50% damage increase, though, yeah. which is the biggest thing. Oh, he's this is rough. He might end up getting fifth place on the meter on this one, and that is not, <laughs> he not deserves the it. place you want to be. It's going to be close. Yeah, you can see. Oh my goodness, Alex is actually ramping here at the end of this fight as well. But it, actually, the crown on the damage meter on this pull is going to be going to that elemental shaman with the Affliction Warlock in a close second and Holy Paladin in a solid third place as well. Evolving are going to advance to our championship Sunday with a 2-0 victory over Pieces Donkeys in a commanding Sanguine Depths performance. Sub 15 minutes, Woo! holy moly.
Let's get into it. All right, so we know that straight away both of these teams are going to be one of those really crazy pulls. Even though we know that I think Obey Alliance is going to do a slightly bigger pull as they're going to get that Brute in. Never mind, Ambition is doing the same thing as they're also gathering up the Brute. Nerf dropping incredibly low just right before he leaped back to that Lantern. Let's see whichever team is going to get that pull done quicker. It looks like um, that Mist Dancer is taking quite a long time for Ambition to get in though as he was just standing still and casting there in the back. Yeah, that mob is completely immune to crowd control effects, if I'm not mistaken, so you're just at the mercy of waiting for it to actually make its way into the pull. Both teams, though, have got everything grouped up in that Venthyr Lantern, so they will be getting those stacks of that buff. Looks like Obey Alliance are having a better job here of dealing their damage to everything more efficiently, right? So they, they, these things should die a little bit ahead of schedule, because like you mentioned, that Mist Dancer, which Ambition of Mark with a Skull, is going to die a little bit slower. You could see though that they were putting some prior damage into it. That's why they put the skull marker on it to try and minimize the impact of that. Yeah, and now both teams are using that shroud, uh, making sure they are going past this um, tormentor here on the left because they have that buff from the lantern. You can see that red glow around their characters, having a huge damage damage increase from that Venthyr Covenant and now they want to go immediately into the boss because they're pulling all of this trash on top of the boss as well and you can see just how much AoE damage is going to come out of that Ash and Halo that the, that the Paladins have saved and then also just all of those procs, look at 40 40 really uh, just prayed to our, the RNG gods as he's just doing so much damage to the Bay Alliance's side. Meanwhile, Azuna on the side of Ambition also carrying the damage here in large part due to that Night Fae Covenant ability uh, that he has access to. Notably, Zorthus on the side of Obey Alliance instead optimizing a little bit more for single target damage with that Venthyr choice instead. And you can see that even though he's doing a lot less overall, Crixus the Voracious is a little bit lower health on the side of Obey Alliance, perhaps because of that extra single target they're getting there. Yeah, very possible. The difference in Covenant choices here for the Frost Mages, we've already seen that before in dungeons like the other side, where some uh, mages go for more AoE and others go for more single target. And really as pros and cons in both, you can see Ambition catching up a little bit on boss percentage, but it is tyrannical, so each percentage is quite a lot of HP. And neither of the teams decided to pull that Tormentor into the boss. That is something we've seen them do before before but this time around neither of the teams are doing that so once Crixus is dead they're gonna have to go back and deal with the tormentor unless they want to deal with that fire damage <laughs> dot on the last boss Which, and I uh, don't think that don't. is gonna happen <laughs> yeah another interesting difference here between builds we've actually seen this out of lag bug before um is a little bit more uh, actually, no, not not for this one. Okay, they're, they're, the, the two Paladins are on pretty much the same game plan this time. Previously, we've seen Lagbug play a little bit more of like a, a raid-style build in, in dungeons like Mist, but here he has gone uh, in for that full damage, uh, as well as Elsmere. So you can see both Holy Paladins dealing 15,000 DPS as this boss is reaching the end of its health. Just completely absurd damage numbers for those healers, as they're kind of angling now to get started with this next pull. Ambition have actually squeezed out a little bit more damage, so despite pulling the boss a little bit later, they are going to kill it a couple seconds ahead of schedule here. Meanwhile, Obey Alliance killing the boss a little bit later, but look, both teams are starting the incinerator pull at the same time, because Obey Alliance moved the boss to this part of the room right before finishing it, whereas Ambition had to run for a little bit after the boss died. Yeah, and Ambition going into this pool with 2% extra trash compared to Bay Alliance, I do believe they might have pulled like a, a one extra tick into the boss the Bay Alliance is dealing with now on this trash pool. You can see Ambition actually having a amount of a damage dealing with this so Ooh. quickly. So even though they pulled it at the <laughs> same time, it just exploded one C. You can see the damage meter just completely annihilating this pack as Obey Alliance just now is getting it done and still having that Brute up as well. That That's probably the one thing that Ambition pulled into the boss. They had a double Brute, while Obey Alliance only had a single Brute pulled into the boss. Wow, the, the, the damage from Onesie there just completely, completely <laughs> absurd from the Windwalker. Definitely the Dance of Chi-Chi is smiling upon Ambition in this one. <laughs> They're now getting started with another big pull. This one's actually quite scary with the double inspiring aura. You just have no way to stop any of these casts that are coming out. And you can see everybody's health bars are going to start being attacked on the side of Ambition. A rough quaking coming out as well as everything is dying. 
Elsmere though doing a good job of keeping everybody okay. Dwarf Racial being used to remove that debuff. Obey Alliance getting started with the same pull. Yeah, that inspiring, uh, definitely not helping out here as he cannot interrupt any of those. Uh, oppressor casts that are doing a huge amount of damage to their group, as well as just not having any sort of AoE stuns that can help out the tanks either. You can see Nerf did already proc that cheap death on his side, while Skylark still has a, that available for him on a Bay Alliance side. But Ambition, because they just dealt with this um, Tormentor pull earlier so much quicker than a Bay Alliance, they're already done here. And that now they're gathering up that Overseer, double Overseer pack with the inside pack as well, with all of those oppressors. Surely there's going to be some inspired mobs here too. So lots of um, AoE damage required here to make sure they can get this done. Ash and also being um, committed here by Elismir. Another cool build difference between these two teams is they're both starting off a massive, massive Venthyr Lantern pool actually is on their tanks. Nerf is playing that Kyrian Demon Hunter legendary, which I haven't seen anybody use before, but is the um, extra soul fragments and a bunch of stats after you hit Elysian Degree, which is something that they have on a fairly short cooldown, especially with that Forge Light Soulbind tree. And so you can see Nerf gets quite a bit of value out of that. Skylark instead, on the more traditional Fell Devastation, has a chance to not incur its cooldown and give you the Fury back legendary. Wow, I, I think Ambition actually adapted their strategy here because yeah. if I'm not completely mistaken, I think this was a Bay Alliance strategy. They are were the ones that uh, pulled Baruth into the next trash area and just skipped that mini boss. And I think Ambition adapted to this strategy now as well, as they are pulling this um, this Tormentor into the Warden. And you can see Obey Alliance doing that same thing. So interesting to see that Ambition adapted to Obey Alliance strategy, even though um, they had a different one when they played against each other last time. Maybe they changed it up because they were the ones losing against Obey Alliance, so they must have, uh, you know, reworked their route and see what Obey Alliance did different. Yeah, the thing is, when you actually play against another team and, and you lose to them, you do want to test what they're doing, right? And see, like, okay, is there, is there any part of their route that's just better than ours? Uh, and so you just run and you test it, and event you can find these things where it's like, oh, yeah, this is just 30 seconds faster. Like, what, we should just be doing this, right? Uh, some things instead are a little bit harder to adapt, right? Stuff like playing the Affliction Warlocks that some teams use in this dungeon. That would require a full overhaul of the path. But Ambition can basically do the same dungeon strategy as before and change like two or three pulls and have those advantages if they find them to be a time save other times you lose to a team and you're like actually our path our strategy is still better we just executed it badly but uh, this time it definitely seems like ambition has put in the time to test the obey alliance differences in pathing yeah and it seems to be working out great for ambition as they dealt with this so quickly they did pick up that, si that the other Lantern buff as well. You can see all of those glows around their characters again. So they want to be carrying this buff into the next Lantern. You can see over there um, that is going to be activated in just a second. Once they pull all of this trash back, you can see Nerf jumping back to the Lantern. Elismir opening up the Lantern. And now they're going to be refreshing that duration of the buff. And they want to keep it for the boss. That's going to be the important part. They want to make sure that no one goes down uh, here at this point because they want to keep that buff on all of the DPS importantly to make sure that the boss is going to be nice and easy for them to deal with. Wow, Skylark, great, great play on that Vengeance Demon Hunter, barely preventing his cheat death from being procced. Does have to use Fell Devastation, so he won't have it for the start of the pull here. But still, look at them grouping everything up here beautifully, using that little line of, spite, line of sight spot right around the corner there. They've now got all of the mobs beautifully in range of that Venthyr Lantern, which has already been opened. This will be a refresh of their buffs, and then a bunch of new ones. Meanwhile, Nerf on the side of Ambition getting started with the boss here, as they also have a bunch of stacks of that damage amp. And look at Onesie just blowing up all these mobs. JPC, though, the man himself on the rogue, also doing a lot of damage here. Black Powder, being, he's, he's been given the, the permit to cast Black Powder on this one, not just required to hit only Eviscerates, and there he goes. Unfortunately, two people did get hit by the beam, and Asuna 
um, decided to dispel himself instead of dispelling one C. Good choice, as uh, he is the one doing more damage than the damage meter <laughs> as well. So very, very well done by Asuna. Esther, have to finish up the scribe still in the corner that is throwing research at them, but looks like it's not a high priority uh, at the moment. Esther is still focusing Torvald and also the manifestation that spawns that does a huge amount of AOE damage to the group on top of this castigate as well. Lagbat? Lagbuck actually committing the Ashen here in comparison to Elismere holding it for the next boss probably. So interesting difference here in strategy. Not sure if this was something that they maybe decided on the fly. Maybe they um, didn't have enough offensive cooldowns or they think that the boss would have lasted too long without that uh, Ashen Hollow being committed by Lagbuck. But that means the next boss is going to be quite a lot more difficult for Obey because that next boss, uh, they're not going to have uh, the buff anymore and they're also not going to have Bloodlust they want to use. So there's so much incoming damage that they have to deal with without that uh, Ashen Hollow available in the Paladin. Yeah, both teams though, I mean, with the, the commitment of those resources, you can see that Obey Alliance have really caught up on this boss, and they are actually going to be killing this boss right at the exact same time as each other. So now less than one second separating these two teams, the exact same percent as well, but crucially, Elismir has Ashen Hallow available and Lagbug does not. So I would give an advantage right now, just the tiniest advantage to Ambition as they get started oh, with this crash into oh, boss pull. So do Obey Alliance though, the exact same pull. They will not have Ashen Hallow for this. Is Elismir going to send it here? Maybe gonna hold it for a little bit so they get some more healing and there it goes. It's cast right now into this big damage explosion from the boss. It looks like his wings uh, weren't up just yet. Now the wings are back though, so I hope he's gonna be popping those wings in just a second on Elismir's side. As of Alliance, of course, does not have that Ashen available, so they're gonna have to deal with this trash without that extra cooldown. And you can see just how much damage comes out in this group while the boss is casting that AoE, and then a lot of tank damage as well with those iron spikes coming out. They do have this one oppressor that is inspired to seat um, in the corner next to Sogodon, you can see for both of those groups. So they're gonna be pulling that in in just a second whenever they feel like they are um, somewhat safe on those HP pulls. So <laughs> Elsmir actually has just popped his wings now. He didn't need to do it for so long because he got back-to-back -back awakening blocks. Awakening is one of the talents that Holy Paladins use these days that gives them a 15% chance on Word of Glory or Light of Dawn to get wings for 10 seconds. And so Elsmere, he was just sitting there in wings without having to actually press that button. That's going to mean his entire Ashen Hallow was wings up. And you can see on the damage meters the benefits of the Ashen Hallow and the wings, although a little bit less than usual because, you know, a lot of healing needed to be done on this pull as well. Couldn't just go full damage. It's actually very interesting because um, look, if you look at the boss's HP, Obey Alliance actually a little bit ahead at this point, even though Ambition seems to be having more of these offensive cooldowns with the Ashen. So maybe because uh, Elismir had to heal so much, because this boss does so much AoE damage, um, that, that's why maybe Obey Alliance made the more efficient choice of using the Ashen on a previous boss, maybe getting more damage out there um, compared to get, using the Ashen here. So this is a very interesting, a small difference it seems like, but the Obey Alliance was, was behind for a couple of seconds before they committed the Ashen on the previous boss, and Ambition didn't catch up uh, that time that, um, with the Ashen on this boss. So, slight difference in cooldown usage, and it seems to be in favor of Obey Alliance. Yeah, notably Obey Alliance will have their next Ashen available sooner. I wonder how many more casts there will be left in this dungeon. Probably two if you're Obey Alliance, right? If you hit that button on cooldown, yeah. you probably get it on the last boss. Whereas Ambition may be in a position where they only get one more Ashen Hallow for the entire dungeon. Obey Alliance wasting no time getting started with Sagadon, and Ambition also making a... Uh, an audible from their strategy that lost against Obey Alliance earlier in this tournament uh, and deciding to pull Zogadon instead of trying to deal with the last boss with that physical damage taken increase. A very understandable decision. It would take an immense amount of self-confidence to be able to send that strategy that lost the last time again. Uh, I'm sure they would do it if they thought it was right, but I think that when that happens, you, you kind of are like, okay, actually, this is just not, it's not consistent enough for us. Yeah, one more thing to note here is that um, Lightbug just now got his Ashen back when Sogodon was at like 40% HP. And I wonder if it maybe would have been the right choice to just pop it in case 
like, just so he gets it back on the last boss. Because I'm not sure if the time is going to be enough for mm -hmm. him to use it on that first pull here and then again on the last boss. Not sure if there's going to be quiet four minutes in between those two. So uh, we will see about that later on as both of those teams now use that shroud to go past this trash and directly go into this gauntlet, making sure they use as much focus target damage as possible on general call. Yeah, getting started with this big pull. You can see on the side of Obey Alliance, they use the extra action button right on pull. You can do that, right? And it will come back by the time the first Bloom Burst comes around. Uh, and in fact, if you're pushing General Call fast enough, you can actually just use it whenever because she will never get to that cast. Both teams, though, are doing basically the exact same thing as each other, and I cannot overstate just how close this game is so far. Obey Alliance have pushed General Call below 80% or below 90% here. Ambition actually a little bit slower on this check. Zhuen has been popped here by Onesie. It's just about to expire as they are now making their way to the second pull. So I would say maybe something like five seconds in favor of Obey Alliance here. Both Paladins holding on to that Ashen Hallow. There will be one more Ashen Hallow this dungeon. Yeah, this is so incredibly close. They are now close to this last lantern of the dungeon. You can see on the right hand side for both of those teams. Um, they are, they want to be using that lantern buff for the last boss. Uh, both of these teams are going to be pulling some trash into the last boss with those um, with the one tormentor debuff that they didn't do. So it's only going to be the 50% slow that they have to deal with in the last boss. No other tormentor debuffs are going to be there, but they still want to have that lantern buff there just to uh, get through that uh, huge amount of HP on the last boss because it is 22 tyrannical. So now they're going to gather up that pool. You can see the tanks are running ahead on both sides, making sure to pull all of that trash backwards to. To, um, activate that lantern and get that buff onto the group. Yeah, you can see the opening cast from both teams as those lanterns open up at right about the same time as each other. The entire pull now getting grouped up here. Again, Obey Alliance have something like five seconds extra here. Both teams, though, do have an extra caster. They can't quite hit all of them with the Sigil of Silence, and so they need to kick one of them in. And it's all going to come down to who can get done with this pull first, and then also who can execute the last boss better. Yeah, and then one more thing to note is that the Bay Alliance actually had to pull a bet into this pool to get enough percentage, while Ambition somehow didn't need to do that. They got a little bit of extra percentage somewhere else in the dungeon, so they didn't have to focus a bet down here, but a Bay Alliance still dealing with this quicker. They are now done. They have those buffs, they have the Bloodlust available, they're going to be getting into the last boss pool in just a second, and we'll see if it goes right, but it's so close for the two. Oh my there's goodness. zero deaths on both sides, so there's no a uh, time penalty on either of those teams, so we'll see how they execute this last pull. Yeah, this is probably going to be our best run of Sanguine Depths of the weekend, barely beating our second best run as both teams get into the boss room. The Ashen Hallows will be coming down shortly. Obey Alliance are going to be the first to pull the boss there, popping every single cooldown in existence and their time warp as well. Meanwhile, Ambition getting the exact same thing going, and it's just going to be about damage. It's going to be about general call boss damage. All of these ads, all this extra stuff, that's just a distraction. That, that will die, but they need to focus as much single target as possible. And you can see it's actually Ambition that hit the 63% mark a hair ahead of where Obey Alliance are at. So somehow Ambition have found a little bit more damage onto this boss. They still have to get all the way to 50% though, and this is such a tiny lead, but it does appear to be growing a little bit for Ambition. 58 to 60 are the two boss health totals now. Obey Alliance need to find some extra little bit of gas here to catch back up. Yeah, Ambition somehow just finding so much single target damage on this pool. Looks like they just used a lot more uh, onto the boss while maybe Obey Alliance was focusing a little bit more on killing that trash that they pulled with the boss. And you, it looks like Ambition is close to 2% ahead on the boss now. And on a 22 Tyrannical on General Cal, that is quite a lot. I'm not sure what kind of miracle uh, happened for Ambition, but this is so important for them. It's so close between those two. Look at the boss health. I'm just staring at the numbers, uh, looking at who is going to be able to get General Cal down quicker. And it looks like there's only 2% left for Ambition because, of course, this boss dies at 50%. And the Bay Alliance just not managing to get to the same amount of single target DPS quiet. Wow, okay, so Ambition did get the boss done, and what a run! I mean, look at the amount of damage they're doing, crazy, wow. 
That is just a straight damage difference on the boss. Obey Alliance still hasn't taken it down yet. Look at this. This is actually ridiculous. to do all of them, so let's see what we get in this game. That's right. Game number one starting up between Echo and Reload, Reload Esports. We're already underway, so let's take it here into Sanguine Depths. All right, so already from the get-go, we see some big pulls from both of those teams. Uh, if you look at the comp, very similar. The only difference we have is a Shadow Priest on Reload side, while Echo is um, choosing to play that Windwalker Monk. Both of the mages playing Frost as well. Yeah, both of them playing Frost, and we know that Frost is really useful, especially in a situation like we're in the Sanguine Depths, where what we saw from the Mega Pump yesterday, it's just back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back massive pulls where you can have your cooldowns and damage up for every single pull, rather than kind of just being reliant on that combust cooldown. Uh, and also, not playing Frost instead of Fire frees up that Shadow Priest position as well for a better spec, right? The comp that Echo's running right now, this Windwalker Monk Rogue Mage spec, seems like it's pretty much the Exodia comp of, of this season, where you have the Frost Mage and the Rogue there to do as much focus damage as possible, and then the Windwalker just blasts the AoE, and this is it right here, this big pull, this is what we saw from Omega Pump yesterday, and it worked out great for them. Almost everyone in the group is going to be doing 60k plus DPS as they burst down these ticks, and at the same time, they're going to be focusing down a ton of boss damage from that Rogue and Frost Mage. Check it out, the trash is all dead instantly already, and the boss is at half HP. Well, but Reload actually did a little bit of a bigger pull because they actually got the Tormentor in there as well. You can see Arcoloth is there, while Echo decided to not um, actually pull that Tormentor. They just pulled, um, I think, the two or even three Brutes that they pulled on top of this with all of the ticks that were in this hallway. While Reload Esports decided to skip one of the Brutes in the back, but they did uh, pull that Tormentor instead, which definitely, if Echo decides to go back and deal with that Tormentor afterwards, which is to be expected because no one wants to deal with that uh, fire dot at the last boss, then Reload Esport actually could make up some time if they execute this properly, and it does seem like they're doing it. They just, they killed the Tormentor, they killed the mobs, they only have the boss left to deal with. Yeah, and actually, uh, now that I think about it, Echo's kind of inching towards the rest of the dungeon. There's no shot they're just going to skip Incinerator hmm. whatsoever, right? Like... I don't think so, no. Okay, maybe they were just positioning for orb, orb spawn so they could kind of away towards the Tormentor. I mean, that that was... Uh, that would have been interesting. I don't think... Have we seen teams skip Incinerator in, like, any dungeon yet? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Nope. That'd be wild. I think, like, the only dungeons where it would be possible is, like, if it's a fortified dungeon that is, like, really low level where you can just completely blast the boss uh, in, you know, just during Bloodlust or something, I, I guess. But otherwise, it would be incredibly hard to deal with this magic debuff. And then you also have to consider that um, if you don't, like, if you leave Arcoleth up, then you kind of have to kill the roof because you can't have, like, a dot and a 50% healing reduction. Right. That would be, like, way too much damage. And if you have to pick one or the other, then you might as well just kill Arcoleth because it's just harder to deal with, I guess. But yeah, reload esports. I mean, it almost seems like they're actually ahead in the dungeon at this point, even though that Trash is uh, in favor of Echo, but that Trash pull that they're doing right now should be close to the percentage that Echo just got from that pull before. So very close between those two teams. And Reload Esports yesterday, to be honest, I mean, yes, they didn't play well in that Necrotic Wake where they had uh, multiple wives to the third boss, but the dungeon before and up until they, the, everything falling apart, I think they did actually do well, and they had a lot of those like really MDI style big pulls. So I do think if Reload Esports plays clean, then their struts and their routes are actually really good. Yeah, and I mean, we were talking about teams going bigger on pulls. Looks like Echo is done up on, on, on Reload Esports here to get themselves back into the game gone for all of the trash that Reload Esports just dealt with at the same time, but they're also pulling it on top of the Lantern so they can start stacking that buff right now, and they'll have that damage buff available for the pull that both teams are about to do, whereas Reload Esports will not have that available. So you would think that this pull is going to go much better for Echo since they're essentially doing 50% more damage and healing, as Jack likes to mention, but who really cares about that? <laughs> True, no one really cares about that. Looks like Reload actually pulled that second sentinel that patrols around there. I'm not sure if that was intended or if that was a mistake. 
Uh, it's possible that they just intended to pull this in to get an extra little bit of percentage so they can skip something later on. But uh, we see this very rarely. Usually the Sentinels, you don't really want to play them if you can skip. Um, because they have so much HP and uh, they have the frontal, do lots of tank damage. But yeah, it looks like Reload Esports just carrying the Sentine Sentinel through to the next pool, which seems decently efficient. They also put uh, they also pulled a Dread Bat as well. So they are actually... Um, make, they're doing a lot of trash in this area here, and it seems to be decently efficient because they have these lantern buffs, right? So they have this extra damage, and it makes it easier for them to deal with this trash percentage here. Well, Echo um, is moving on to that uh, to Veruth, already almost down actually, and they're also dealing with the mini bus as well. This was actually Salia's um, Ash and Hollow timing, so big AOE damage coming in for this pool for them. Yeah, and the big thing here is going to be whether or not the teams can actually extend their Lantern buffs off of this, right? This is a huge, huge deal here. I would say for both teams, they probably have maybe 20 seconds of their buff left, so they're, if they're able to get to the next Lantern and kill that Quill Feather, like, right right away, they might be able to go ahead and get that damage buff refresh, and that's going to be huge, because obviously, again, 50% increase of damage is, is very large. Reload Esports has saved that Ash and Hollow for this big pull with Execution of Earth, similar to what Echo did on their end, and it's going to help them get that Lantern buff up, but I, I mean, I wish we were tracking that Lantern buff, because right now, as casters, we don't really know whether or not they're stacking up a new one, or if they have the old one still. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit of a red glow around the players if they have the buff. And I think I see it on both sides. Sometimes so. it's hard to see because the Ashen is in a 4-2 and that also has this red glow. But it looks like both teams still have it. And one more thing to note about the Lanterns as well is that we, Dreadnoughts talked about this earlier, that Sanguine Depths was this dungeon that um, Echo is just really good at and no one could beat them in this dungeon. But that was before they actually changed the Lanterns um, for the buff to last longer. You actually had more time to um, get mobs into the Lantern as well, so the, the Lantern was just up or open for longer. And I do think that was a little bit of a downside for Echo because they were so good with the nerfed Lanterns um, that now that it's easier to actually keep the buff up, all the other teams uh, can do this, just the same thing that Echo did before, right? right? So I do think that domination that they had before, that perfected route there with the Lantern extending, that is, has become a lot easier and literally every team is doing it now. Yeah, and wow, I mean, Reload Esports is playing Echo to the exact same position in the dungeon right now. The only difference is a couple of extra percent on trash. But look at that. At the same time, both teams were setting up for this big pull on top of the lantern using the exact same setup strategy, pulling a bunch of mobs into a ring of frost, letting them get all stacked up, and then once everything is all together, blast it on top of the lantern. And Echo only has about a 5 to 10 second advantage right now on this trash. This is crazy to see. Really, those, really, Esports is playing so much better right now than they played yesterday. I agree, Real Esports has a really good route here. I really liked the fact that they pulled that Torment down to the first boss. It really made up a lot of time. And even though Echo is trying to catch up, uh, and I mean, they did catch up, but only for a couple of seconds. You can see Reload now also engaging uh, Tarvald. And you can see, if you look at the Ashen timers, both of the Paladins are going to be using it for that next pull onto the next boss. And they just keep, they use their Lantern buffs for Tarvald here. So they're not going to be using too many offensive cooldowns um, because they have that buff from the Lantern. And then afterwards, when they go to the next boss room, then that's where they're going to be committing the rest of their cooldowns, um, the Mage cooldowns and the... Holy Paladin cooldowns they have available still. And look at the damage from Reload Esports, they actually caught up quite a bit. Um, they pulled the boss a couple of seconds later, but look at their damage. I mean, they're super close to Echo at this point. Yeah, I mean, this is extremely close. And one of the questions I have for this strategy is, did Echo just mess up? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to downplay the way Reload Esports is playing right now. They're playing phenomenally, but I think it was a pretty typical strategy we saw yesterday where teams would pull Incinerator Arcoleth into that first pull, and actually, I think after this dungeon's over, I'm, or after this series is over, I think over, it was only message. one. Was it, I was think it was one? only a Mega Pump that did that, yeah. I thought the other team did as well. So. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I feel like a team like Echo is pretty pretty used to seeing another team pull up a strategy and be like, oh, we could do that, <laughs> and then just doing it. Yeah, right? that's what I was thinking too, yeah. It might be, like, maybe they just don't think it's faster, I guess, could be the reason, right? Maybe they... Uh, think you want to have more trash in that first area, and if you want to pull all the trash and you can't pull it all on top, so you might as well split it into two. I don't know, but uh, yeah, definitely very interesting to see the differences in strats. Now, both of them 
are engaging um, the next boss with all of the trash in that area. Of course, uh, they're leaving Sagadon up into the corner. We'll see if any of those teams decide to skip Sagadon. Uh, we've seen that happen yesterday with the uh, Omega Pump. They didn't deal with Sagadon. It was a little bit of a struggle on the last boss because that charge just does so much damage. Uh, yeah, reload dropping Ooh. incredibly low. Looks like they're fine, but yeah, all of that bursting happened at the same time as the AoE from the boss, so everyone dropped incredibly low. Yeah, a little bit of difference in cooldowns here. Uh, Zelia had that Ash and Hollow combo up at the very start of the pull, so it was able to help them burst down that trash pack so they didn't have the bursting stacks at the same time as the AoE damage from the boss, whereas Reload Esports like, only just got the Ash and Hollow up off cooldown right as the trash died. That's why they were all so incredibly low there, and it looked really scary, but they were all in the Ash, and they had the massive spell for the bursting stack, so it was a lot scarier. It was it looked a lot scarier than it actually was, as long as they you know paid attention to their health and didn't die to like one single tick of damage, they would have been totally fine with that passive uh, healing and follow. But uh, even with that said, I mean, same cooldowns across the board, Echo is still just holding that very slight lead over Reload Esports. And have to mention this as well, they did have a trash percentage advantage earlier. The trash percentage is dead even across the board now, so it's really just going to come down to pure execution in this last section of the dungeon in that gauntlet. And, uh, I'm really interested to see what the strategy is going to be here. I feel like Echo ha have to have something big planned because they've kind of been conservative in the rest of the dungeon. One of the things in Omega Pump's strategy yesterday that I thought they could have gone a little bit harder on if they wanted to is they only went for a double pull at the beginning of this gauntlet here. A typical strategy we've seen in, in last seasons is to actually pull those first two packs all the way to the Lantern. So you can get that initial lantern buff stacking right away, and Omega Pump didn't do that. So let's see if Echo's going to do that here, and looks like they're not going to be going for it. They're just going to go for the, the double pull on top of it. So I think the reason why they don't want to do that is because they want to keep the lantern buff for the boss, right? So right. if you would go there immediately and stack up your lantern, then you might not have enough time to do the trash plus the boss as well. Because the boss is really difficult. Both of the teams, I really like this by the way, both of the teams left up Sogodon, which is going to be incredibly difficult, but this is the more efficient strategy, right? Usually we've seen teams skip, um, or sometimes we've seen teams skip Varuth, but they did Sogodon instead. Um, just because on this specific boss in Sanguine Depths, um, everyone takes physical damage. So having that 50% physical damage increase is really dangerous because of that charge of the boss and the bleed effect that stays behind. But uh, some of the teams decided, you know what, we're going to kill Sagadon because it's too risky, but we're going to deal with Baruth instead so we don't have the 50% healing reduction aura. But uh, Baruth gives you a DPS power and Sagadon gives you a defensive power. So both Echo and Reload Esports killed both of the offensive um, powers uh, that they get from the Tormentors and they left out the defensive ones. So even though it's, it's a little bit more difficult to deal with this combination, you get that extra damage boost. So I really like that strat coming in by both Echo and Reload. And it looks like Reload is already at the Lantern uh, just trying to get General Kyle down, actually. I think they uh, were struggling a little bit with that single target damage on Kyle, making sure that um, the f she faces. Yeah, it looks like they didn't pop the lantern just yet, and neither team has actually. They're letting General Call phase mm -hmm. to that 80%, that, that third final phase of the gauntlet. Once General Call is active and they pull the trash pack, then they will activate the lantern, start stacking out that buff like you mentioned, and that way, also like you mentioned, they'll have that 10 stack lantern buff when they stealth through to the final boss and pull that with trash and bloodlust in every single cooldown of the book. And yeah, no, you're totally right. That makes way more sense than just really having the lantern for the 100 to 70 phase. I, I wasn't even really thinking about that, to be honest. It, I'm not, it actually looks like Reload Esports had, already has the Lantern buff, so I'm not sure if they're gonna still have it for the boss. It looks like they were dealing with the Lantern before, and now they're dragging everything on top of the boss with this trash still up. Oh man, this? is actually this? incredibly dangerous. If they're gonna be engaging the boss here, then they might actually just need Echo to execute this properly. They still have the Lantern buff up. They're engaging the boss now. They have Bloodlust. Everything's running. Ash and Hollow is popped. And Echo isn't even at the boss just yet. Reload Esports is so fast. We saw Omega Pump clear this dungeon yesterday in 19 minutes. And we thought that is fast. And now they're at the boss and it's 14 minutes into dungeon. This is absolutely insane what Reload Esports is showing us here. I mean, Reload Esports just pulled a fast one. Echo spent all of that time finishing off the trash at the Lantern. And while they were doing that, Reload Esports just pulled the rest of the trash to the boss and it's gained them a 3 or 4 percent advantage on the boss once the cooldowns are down here. But it's going horribly wrong for Reload Esports as their healer goes down right before the Gloom Squall. 
I believe, okay, it's not going to be a cheat death on the rogue. They're able to get the res up, but that's the Ashen Hollow completely gone. And in the time they took resing him, Echo has completely caught up on the boss percentage. And we are now neck and neck. And Echo has now actually come into the lead as well. And on top of that, this is going to be really important with how close together these teams are. That five seconds of death time are going to be a killer for me. I actually just kind of believed how close these two teams are. At this point, Echo is ahead in boss percentage and they have that 5 seconds advantage in their favor as well. But this is so... I almost want to say it's unfortunate for real esports that... Because um, if Echo would have made any mistake, one single mistake, then Real Esports would have would have done it, right? But because their healer died at the end, lost the Ashen, their route was literally just faster. Reload had a faster route, it was, but Echo yeah, executed their route, um, their route better, and they had no mistakes, and now it's Echo that is going to be winning this with a really quick 15 minutes 34 uh, time. But wow, I mean, Real Esports, what a strut. Just when wow. you think that you have the edge on Echo, you, one little trip up, one little mistake, and Echo is right there to be able to take it from you.